We're going to spend two sessions on verse 14 of John 1 in order to answer the question, what is Christmas? And I know that some of you are listening to this or watching this in in uh, July <laughs> or March, and uh, I think I would just say it is never, ever out of date to understand the meaning of Christmas. It changes our Julys and Marches and Septembers. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord, we want to see your glory. We want to experience your grace for our guilt. We want to taste your truth for the blindness and ignorance of our lives. And so come and show yourself to us as we study together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three things in this session. The Word, who is He? Became flesh. What does that mean? Dwelt among us. What are the implications of that? So let's take those one at a time. The Word became flesh. Here we are at verse 14, and we have to go back now to verses 1 to 3, because here's where he defined clearly for us what the Word is. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, all the way back, as far back as you can go, the Word was there. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the first thing we say about the Word is that he is with God. Second thing, was God. Third thing, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made, all things were made through him. Now, if you stopped right there, a Jehovah's Witness might say, well, clearly he doesn't include himself in what he made uh, so he could be made. And that's what they believe. They believe that he was the archangel and that God made the Son first. He made Jesus first, Christ first, and then Christ, with God the Father, made everything. Now, I think John is writing this to rule that out. That's why it sounds so strange. Doesn't this sound awkward? I mean, you'd expect him to stop right there. All things were made through him, period. But he adds, and without him was not anything made that was made. The point of saying that is everything that was made, everything that is in the category of made, that was made, everything in the category of made, are you hearing that? Everything that is in the category of made the Son made, which means the Son is not in the category of made because the Son did not make the Son. He wasn't there to make the Son if he was not made. And therefore, the Son is always there. He was in the beginning with God, and he was God, so he was not made. Let me draw in one other thing here. Go back to 114. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, Son from the Father. Now that is the first time this word is used in the gospel here, and it's going to be used 60 times because Son of God is one of the most important phrases in the Bible and in this gospel. And isn't it interesting that Muslims say uh, Christians say God plus Mary equals Jesus, Son of God, which equals blasphemy. And that's right. Of course it does. Amen. That's blasphemy. 
because that's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not what the Christian church has ever taught. And, and John is trying to help us understand the, the metaphor or the image of sun by putting it right here at the beginning in the context where he's explaining the sun is the word. And the word is with God from the beginning, and he is God. So the Son of God is not the product of conception with Mary. He was there eons before Mary ever existed, and he is divine, and he's not the product of a creation because he was not made. And the point, so we're at four now, of saying he's the Son is that the, the Father always had, Father always had, a perfect image of himself. He always had one to relate to, and he stands forth as this image, the image of God, as a distinct person who is with God and is God. That's what son means. And that's why it's here in the context. If you ever want to explain somebody how Jesus is the Son of God, take them to the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John. So the first thing Christmas is, is that um, God exists and God is with God, yes, paradoxical as it is, and he is not made, and he is son of God. And the next thing is he became flesh, which implies, one, he was not flesh. He was spirit before the creation of the world that he made, and then he enters into it and becomes flesh. That is, he becomes man. Look at the use of the word flesh here in John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus says. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so giving his life is the point of having flesh. He became flesh so that he could die. And the third thing is that he will always be man. He doesn't leave behind his body. If you go to chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said to him, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And he was speaking about the temple of his body. He's going to raise up his body. He's not going to leave it in the grave. He's always going to have a body. And Paul makes that plain here in Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Makes me want to dance by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Jesus today has a glorious body, and he's coming back, and our lowly body, these get sick, cancer-ridden, dying bodies, are going to be raised and conformed to his glorious body. And therefore, I say, always, forever, Jesus will be a God-man. He has taken humanity into the very deity. Breathtaking. And lastly, he dwelt among us. And I used to think because this is a Greek word for pitch a tent that it meant temporary, like he, he's only going to spend 30 years among us. And then I noticed that the same word is used in the book of Revelation for the final tending of God among us when he'll be with us forever and ever. And I say, whoops, that was a wrong inference from tent, temporary. Rather, now I see, don't you see, that to pitch a tent among us, to dwell among us, is to get near to us. It's to have access to us. It's proximity. 
That's the point of Christmas. So Christmas is one, God, the Word, two, becoming man so that he might die, three, to be near his people. And there's more in this text next time.